Welcome to the third video of the Edinburgh Guide to the PSA. This video will focus on Section 3, Planning Management. As a brief overview, the purpose of this section is to decide on the most appropriate management option for the patient in a particular clinical scenario. These questions consist of a brief clinical scenario and a list of five management options, only one of which is correct. The typical layout of the question is the clinical history, including a past medical history and drug history, followed by examination findings and relevant investigations. You will need to establish the likely diagnosis, the indications for treatment, and take into account any contraindications and cautions that can influence the choice of medications. The management options can be preventative, curative, symptomatic or palliative, and they most commonly include medicines or IV fluids. However, sometimes other strategies, such as physiotherapy or TENS machines for pain relief, can be included. The answers include options that would be of real benefit and others that would be neutral or harmful. Four distractors are often plausible, although clearly less appropriate in the given clinical scenario. It is also possible that all options are true, but one of them must be the most important or most appropriate. There is no all of the above or none of the above type of answers. Within the PSA, this section is worth 16 marks, which accounts for 8% of the total 200 marks available for this exam. It consists of eight questions, each worth two marks. Only one answer is the correct one and partial marks are not available. Common clinical cases found in this section include MIs, COPD, bleeding and haemorrhage, IBD, back pain, dementia, and anticoagulation. Let's now put this into context and move on to our first question. This is a 75-year-old woman who presents to the medical admissions unit via a GP referral with sudden onset breathlessness. She is coughing up frothy white sputum. Her past medical history includes chronic kidney disease and aortic stenosis. She takes aspirin, simvastatin, ramipril and bisoprolol, and she does not have any allergies. On examination, she is breathless, agitated and distressed. She is not pyrexic. Of note, she is tachycardic, hypertensive, tachypneic and hypoxic. JVP is elevated 3 centimetres above the sternal angle. Her breathing is laboured and she is using her accessory respiratory muscles, bilateral crackles or herd and auscultation. Investigations found her to have normal haemoglobin levels, platelets and white blood cells. She is slightly hyperkalemic and her urea and creatinine are high with a low EGFR. Her ABG shows a low oxygen level but a normal carbon dioxide level, pH and bicarbonate. Her ECG shows sinus rhythm. Cardiomegaly and bilateral pleural effusion are visible on her chest x-ray. She has already been given oxygen, so the question is asking you about the most appropriate management option at this stage. Now would be a good time to pause the video and to come up with your own answer. Hopefully you now have an answer, so let's see how you got on. The clinical scenario is the classic picture of pulmonary edema caused by heart failure. The key points in the history that you should pick up on are the sudden onset shortness of breath with a productive cough and aortic stenosis, which is the likely cause of her heart failure. Key examination findings in this scenario are the high blood pressure, the raised JVP, increased respiratory rate, low oxygen saturations and bilateral crackles. These are all characteristic of pulmonary edema. There are no signs of infection in this patient and her kidney function tests are abnormal but consistent with her history of chronic kidney disease. Her potassium is only slightly raised and is not of huge concern at the moment. Finally, 
The chest x-ray finding of cardiomegaly and pleural effusion further confirm the diagnosis of pulmonary edema. Now we need to decide on the most appropriate further management. The correct answer in this case is furosemide, as this patient needs diuretics to treat her pulmonary edema and improve her symptoms. So now let's consider the incorrect answers. Although bendroflumethiazide is also a diuretic, it works much slower and thus is not suitable for use in such an acute scenario. Amoxicillin is not the correct answer as there are no signs of infection. Although she has a raised potassium, it is only moderately elevated and the ECG looks normal. So calcium gluconate would not be used here as it is only used for severe hyperkalemia. And finally, the joxin is used to manage heart failure, but in this acute scenario, her pulmonary edema needs to be managed first. I hope this is now clear why furosemide was the most appropriate option for this case. We will now move on to the second question. This is a 35 year old woman in the 21st week of her very first pregnancy. She is presented to the obstetric triage with a two day history of headache and tiredness. Her past medical history includes borderline hypertension and she does not take any medications or have any allergies. All of her observations are normal except from her blood pressure, which is raised at 166 over 110. Her abdomen is non-tender and urinalysis is negative for blood, protein and leukocytes. All other blood tests are normal. Fetal ultrasound and umbilical artery Doppler are normal as well. This question asks you about the most appropriate management at this stage for this patient. Once again, you should pause here to consider your answer. Now let's walk through the question and compare your answer to ours. The only abnormal finding here is her high blood pressure and her symptoms of headache and tiredness can be attributed to this. The diagnosis is therefore gestational hypertension. This lady's urinalysis was normal, which excludes preeclampsia as a diagnosis. This question therefore checks whether you know that the management of hypertension in pregnant women differs from that of the general population. The correct answer in this case is labetalol. Although all the other options are used to treat hypertension, they are all contraindicated in pregnancy. Amlodipine is not routinely used in pregnant women. Atenolol increases the risk of growth restrictions. Bendroflumethiazide increases the risk of congenital abnormalities. And Ramipril, as an ACE inhibitor, can adversely affect fetal renal function. Labetalol is therefore the only option that can be safely used in pregnancy. I hope that this has made sense and it should show that you should focus on all aspects of the clinical presentation to find the most appropriate management option. Now let's move on to our third and final question. This is a seven year old boy who presents to the emergency department with sudden onset breathlessness and a wheeze. He also has angioedema of his tongue, lips and eyes. He has a nut allergy which has required admissions two years prior for anaphylaxis and he carries an EpiPen with him. However, after eating his friend's cereal bar, his symptoms developed rapidly. A teacher administered his auto-injector, which was able to partially reverse his respiratory and swelling symptoms. However, they still remain, and on examination, he is pale, clammy and breathless, with a rash across his back and chest. His lips, tongue and throat are still swollen, and he is breathless and unable to complete full sentences. His oxygen saturations are 94%, breathing 10 litres of oxygen. On auscultation, a widespread wheeze can be heard throughout the chest. His mast cell tryptase is elevated, as well as his lactate. This question asks you which is the most appropriate management option at this stage. So, it is time here again to pause and consider your answer. Now that you have an answer, let's go through the question. This is a typical presentation for a severe food allergy related anaphylactic attack. 
anaphylaxis is highly likely when the following three criteria are fulfilled. Sudden acute onset and rapid progression of symptoms, life-threatening airway, breathing and or circulation problems, and skin or mucosal changes such as urticaria, angioedema and erythema. There are multiple life-threatening symptoms and some of these include hoarseness, strider, fatigue, cyanosis, low blood pressure and an SpO2 of less than 92%. Although this patient's saturations are still 94%, this is still very worrying as he is on 10 litres of oxygen. In this patient's case, despite already having been administered with 300 micrograms of adrenaline, he still has life-threatening symptoms and signs. So following the resuscitation guidelines, this necessitates a second redose of intramuscular adrenaline before pursuing any other treatments further down the line. Thus, adrenaline is the correct answer. If we now take a look at the other answers, rapid IV fluid challenge is an appropriate treatment. However, in this case, the priority should be the redose of adrenaline as the patient still has life-threatening symptoms. Chlorphenamine and hydrocortisone are used in the post-acute phase and despite their routine use, the evidence supporting their effectiveness in treating anaphylaxis is weak. Salbutamol may also be considered, but only if respiratory symptoms are still present after administering adrenaline. Hopefully, this explanation has clarified any uncertainties you may have had and explained why adrenaline is the most appropriate choice in this case. I hope you've enjoyed this video as part of our Edinburgh Guide to the PSA series. For further study resources, please visit our website. And if you have any queries about anything covered in this video, please contact our team via Facebook or email. And if you do have a minute to spare, we would love if you could complete our feedback form linked below in the description. We look forward to seeing you in our next video, Section 4, Providing Information. <laughs>